Oh, I see some faces this morning. Good to see everybody. I don't have to urge you to turn on your cameras, but I will anyway. Whoever can, please turn on your cameras. <laughs> good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome. Is there anybody here? Did everybody receive the link to the video that I sent you yesterday? Is there anybody here who did not have a chance to watch the video? Uh, yes, I watched and uh, it was really interesting, I think. I watched also yesterday. Good. Errol is still having some, tr some trouble joining for some reason. I see he's still in the waiting room. Is there anybody who did not watch the video? Okay, I think that's a good sign. Um, so uh, with us here is Will, William. Uh, Will, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and uh, we'll continue from there? Yes, yeah, sure, I'm just gonna put my headphones on. Okay, you can all hear me? Okay, so hello to everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, if I can just, uh, I see lots of black screens, so I, I don't know you guys, you get the, the pleasure of seeing my pretty face in the morning. Hello, hello. So anybody who wants to turn on their screen, I would greatly appreciate that to give us some more of a feeling of community and that we're here together. Um, so, um, so my name is uh, William Beisinger. I, uh, I'm Israeli South African, and as we can say, no one is perfect. So I was uh, born in Israel. I was raised in South Africa. I grew up on the, on the border of Siskai, which is a, a territory that has been dissolved. Um, uh, so my, uh, I, my life's work, I've been working in renewable energies and off-grid technologies for about 15 years. And um, I worked with solar thermal uh, companies in Israel and in Spain. I've worked with uh, USAID in Israel, in uh, Jordan, and in the Palestinian territories. And at the moment, I'm working with the Jewish National Fund uh, on developing uh, off-grid technologies uh, to serve uh, communities in developing uh, in the developing world. Uh, so I have a, a very small amount of knowledge, practical knowledge that I've accumulated and uh, uh, developed over the past uh, decade or so. And I also am uh, I'm very uh, honored to be with such a distinguished group. Uh, I've looked at some of your profiles and see that we have some very uh, serious players here and I'm uh, great, uh, greatly honored to, to be with you. Um, do we need to, does anybody have a problem with my English? It's okay, I have a problem with my English too. If anybody has a problem, you can put your hand up and I'll try to explain another way, okay? Um, let me ask a question of you guys. Uh, and I do expect every single one to, to reply. Who has watched the video? Please, please confirm if you have watched the video. Put your hand up or put a, put a, a sign on the board. I see one, two, three, four, five. Last time I'm gonna ask the question, six. Who has watched the video again? Any, okay. So I see six people that have watched the video. Thank you. Okay. So I want to ask the opposite question, just so I understand correctly. Who has not watched the video? Who did not watch the video? Please put your hand up so I can understand. One, two. Okay. So I see that uh, the, the, the mathematics doesn't work out. We have Six people who have watched the video, two have not, and several either refuse to vote or do not understand my question. Um, so, <laughs> um, so here's a question. Uh, the majority of respondents seem to have watched the video. The minority of respondents uh, have not watched the video. And there's a, a middle case of uh, respondents that are not answering. So what would we like to do? Should we watch the video again? Uh, I think, I think if there's you. anybody who said okay. that they didn't watch it, I think we should watch it again, yes. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Um, whoever has watched it, you can take a couple of minutes break, um, and if you or you could watch it again. Uh, I'll share my screen now with sound uh, for the video on YouTube. Okay? For you guys, so what you want to ask, here's your opportunity. Please, there are no sacred cows here. 
please ask. It's the expression to ask as much as you want. Please do so. Anybody who has a question, please uh, raise your hand uh, either in the uh, on the screen or in the chat here. I see that uh, Katarina did. But first, uh, before Katarina, I see that uh, Soso asked a question in the chat. So Soso's question is, will this guest tank volume be enough for family, for example, when there are three persons? So um, so thank you for your question, uh, Soso. The, the, the system that we saw shown in the video is exactly designed for a small family. Um, that system will provide three hours of cooking gas on a small on the small uh, stove top that we saw. We can burn that continuously for three hours, and that should be enough to make a, a, a stew or to cook some eggs or to cook some rice. And we add a, a large bucket, uh, approximately two to three kilograms of uh, of um, uh, raw materials of, of waste. We add into the system, and that keeps the uh, the machine going for about three hours of continuous cooking every single day. It's good for a small family. Uh, Katerina, we have a question from you. Uh, yes, hello uh, here, uh, Katerina from uh, North Macedonia. So maybe my question is a little bit similar with the uh, with the first question. So um, uh, I was uh, wondering uh, how many households uh, can be supplied. Uh, in this uh, village, uh, with the energy produced in this village, and uh, what uh, what's happening in the days when there is no uh, enough sun? Uh, are there any storage batteries included in in this village? Okay, so um, the that system, as we said, Katerina, there's two parts to your question. One was the biogas question, and the other was was a storage question. So I'm going to uh, start off with the biogas question. Um, one system, that system that we saw, which is a 1.2 1, 1 cubic meter system, it's the smallest uh, commercial system that they have. That will provide, as we said, one bucket of about two to three kilograms will provide about three hours of continuous cooking on a single uh, hot stove. Um, and the systems get bigger. They have uh, the next system, which is about uh, twice the size, and then the next system bigger than that is three times the size. So the, it just multiplies according to that multiplier. So if it was double the size, it would be double the amount of people, double the time, triple the size, and so on. Um, we even have another system uh, up the road. We have a very large uh, dairy uh, um, uh, producing milk nearby. And this system actually has a very large, a 100 kilowatt uh, power system, which is very large. It's for um, pasteurizing milk of one of the biggest dairies. So they actually collect the manure from the, from the cattle uh, that as they're standing, they collect the manure and the urine and they pump the system into a very large container. The, the radius of the system is about five meters so 10 meter diameter uh, container. It's also 10 meters, uh, about five meters high. And, and that's a large commercial system. So um, it's, you can go from small, household systems like the one that we have all the way through to very large commercial systems in fact this company this specific company and sorry that i you know i'm, I'm so excited about them he's just he's a personal friend of mine i've seen the the troubles that they went through to 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 make that system they're now producing a a, a, a medium-sized commercial system which is specifically for restaurants so all the time you know we're talking about off-grid and we're talking about serving the the people who are in developing uh, areas which is good and it's necessary. He's also, the company is also addressing um, people who live perhaps more, like, more luxurious lives, people who can afford to go to restaurants. They have a system that you actually uh, apply to a restaurant and you can use the waste from the restaurant. So basically I'm answering you that um, you have many types of system all the way from small domestic all the way through to large commercial. You also asked the second uh, follow-on question, Katharina, about storage. You, if I understand, you, you're asking, are there storage batteries in the park? Could you clarify your question? Yeah, yes, yes, that was uh, my question. About, uh, are there any battery storage? Uh... Yes, we, we have battery storage. We don't, the, 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 the methane system, the biogas system is storing energy in gas. Okay, that's how it stores the, the, the energy. We do use batteries on the solar uh, systems. Um, the, the systems that we have in the house, unfortunately, didn't show you in our short video. Um, we do have some uh, small systems inside the houses themselves that use car batteries, simple deep cycle car battery. Um, and that can be used to power 
uh, a fan that can be used to power LED lighting. It, LED lighting is incredibly important because storing power during the day so that you can use the, the, the electricity at night is incredibly important for creating lighting so that we can actually study. You know, children can come home after school, they can study, they can listen to the radio, etc. Um, also in Africa, we use um, uh, the, the stored, the stored uh, energy to charge bat, uh, telephones. Most of the people in Africa uh, do not have landlines, they have a cellular phone. So it's, in, it's essential to charge uh, small devices. Um, and right now I'm actually working on a larger uh, a storage system up to a 10 kilowatt storage system on a different, in a different facility. And that storage uh, will actually be used to power a water desalinator and a refrigeration system. So we're, we're developing an off-grid uh, kit for farmers. So, uh, so there is storage in the, in the, in the, in the, in our, uh, in our small facility. We use very small storage, but you can go to storage systems that go up to two megawatts, four megawatts, even like some mines in Chile use this. Uh, any, any more questions, friends? Yes, I see Luca and someone else put it there and Magdalena, please. Uh, so Luca, because I saw you first. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Luca Garba from Georgia. I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Uh, one is related to the biogas. Uh, we in Georgia have a very rocky terrain and we have some problems with that. Uh, how structural, well, I have a question regarding structural integrity of this biogas plant. How durable is it? It will not pop. Uh, it's, it had a, a uh, how is it durable is it, essentially? That would be my first question. Okay, so on your first question, look at how durability, um, this, this particular system, the, the small one that we saw, you, you're referring to that one that we yeah. saw in the video. So this yeah. one is actually, it's actually um, flexible. It's made of a very, very, very strong uh, canvas material, which is treated with a, with a very durable rubber. Um, the last system that I had, and, and part, of, part of what I do, Luca, and, and it's, uh, my bosses love me for it and hate me for it also. I, I like to break things. Uh, you know, I've, I think if I have like a, you know, a count of how many uh, devices I've blown up or burnt down or exploded in the years, I should have a medal for it. Um, but this particular one, we had the, the previous system we had installed in the desert for about five years. So it's important for the, for the, for the system to be put on a level surface. I used a, a tractor to level the ground and then I put soft sand so that there wouldn't be any sharp stones but the system itself is completely flexible so even if you have earthquakes and we have some small earthquakes here it won't affect the system um i had so my previous one i was it was in the desert for five or six years and the the it's the sun that actually um perishes uh, breaks down the material and lasted just fine it was only when i had a very massive sandstorm that part of the system was broken but then they brought in this new one that we saw here and it's incredibly durable. I even had um, a class of kindergartners, you know, we're talking about uh, three to four year olds. They came through the system and they all practiced kicking the system for about half an hour. I, I wasn't there, but then when I got there, I found that they were sitting on top of the thing. They were jumping on the thing as if it was a game. And I had to explain to them that it's a, it's a biogas system, but um, it is very durable. Um, and it's designed, it's, it's, they've gone through about 10 years of development uh, in a very, very, very tough conditions. And it's, it's very, very durable. And I, even once uh, with the previous one that, uh, that broke down, they even asked me to report on it. How did it break? How did it tear? And they did a full uh, uh, failure analysis. And, but uh, it's one of those products that that's, I think is very well suited to, to harsh desert environments. Luca, you had a, I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, completely, yes. You uh, had a second question? My second question relates to energy efficiency. Uh, we talked mainly about renewable energy here. And uh, in the village itself, are there any en energy efficiency measures as well to uh, perhaps aid the system and reduce energy consumption or something of that sort? Um, well, I'm trying to understand the question. What is energy efficiency? Um, I think the first level of energy efficiency that the system addresses is using locally produced waste, waste to energy. So, uh, so if, if we can consider that 
uh, better using our local resources is a, an act of efficiency, then I would answer yes, there is a, 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 an energy efficiency gain here. Um, but we do look at other energy efficiency issues in the village, such as better uh, thermal insulation. We didn't see inside, the, inside some of the huts that we have over here. Uh, we have different uh, types of materials that we use for building and for construction for, for thermal uh, insulation. Um, and, but, uh, but most of the stuff has been to better manage our waste. Uh, and, and so uh, we work less on, on, on true energy efficiency gains, but more on just on how to manage the waste more efficiently. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Magdalena Daskalova. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, Magdalena. Uh, okay, uh, my question is, uh, is uh, having in mind that uh, these uh, installations are uh, their purposes for the underdeveloped uh, villages and areas. Uh, my question is, uh, how about the... the necessary quantity of waste and raw materials for the Gaia, uh, biogas installation. Uh, is there a, a enough quantity or how does uh, the supply of this uh, waste and raw materials is managed so you can have uh, the biogas installation working proper, pr properly and uh, continuously? How is this managed? Okay, um, by, by how is this managed? I just want to understand the question better. Uh, um, by how is this managed? Is how much how much material is required to to produce? A yes, how much of is, requi is required, and how is it supplied to the uh, village to the installation? Okay, so uh, on 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 approximate terms, we take one large bucket, which is about two or three kilos, for about three hours of cooking. Um, one large, when I said two, three kilos of wet material, wet uh, material from the kitchen. Um, and in, in, in many off-grid settings, um, there is no formal uh, waste management system. There, there, the waste management system is created by the community. Um, so this system, this appliance is, is trying to actually instill a, a waste management regime within the community. When we installed one of these systems in the uh, Bedouin village, before the goats were allowed to run and, and defecate where they want, and um, the, the, the kitchen waste was thrown into the backyard. And now, because the system is there, the goats, the, the children actually uh, try to collect the waste from the goats and the, the waste from the kitchen is now collected into a bucket. Instead of being thrown onto the floor, it's collected into a bucket and then put inside the system. So it has the use of the appliance and I call it an appliance because it's like how I use a stove or a microwave. Uh, you know, my, my Bedouin neighbor uses this as a stove, as a microwave, it's an appliance for them. Um, the, the, the installation of this appliance uh, requires that the user changes their, their, their waste management and energy management. So this is how the, it's, it actually contributes to a more efficiency in waste management. Uh, has that somehow answered your question, Magdalena? Uh, yes, uh, but, uh, but um, also my question is, uh, is this waste, uh, everyday waste from the people that live there enough for the biogas installation to work? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, I, I mean, it's a look. It's a it's a it's a kind of a relative question um, because uh, in in my family, for my for example, uh, we're vegetarian, so we eat a lot a lot a lot of vegetables, and we are three in my family. So in my family, it would be enough. But I also have my neighbor who doesn't eat so many vegetables, and he's also a family of three. And for him, he won't have enough waste, so he has to put he has to find some extra waste. Um, uh, so this is the, this is the case. I think it's a, we, we say two to three kilograms should be enough for three hours of continuous cooking. Um, so if you put in less, uh, less, uh, organic waste, obviously you will have less cooking. Uh, unfortunately, you do have a minimum, uh, input requirement. Okay. Thank you. It's clear now. I see there's a question in the, uh, or a comment, I think it's a good idea also to recycle plastic and use them to make new containers. Yes, recycling is, is best. Refuse, uh, reuse, 
uh, recycle. And uh, this is this is the way. Repurpose. Uh, Repurpose. There's a whole lot what of re. <laughs> what is it? It was it was it was a uh, refuse, reduce, reuse, uh, re refuse, reduce, reduce, uh, re recycle. Yeah. Repurpose. And another one. There's there's and five. Something else. It used to be only there's... three, but now there's five. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions about maybe other uh, systems that you saw in the park? The solar uh, array, the water systems, things like that as well. I think we've answered all of the questions. We've solved the world's problems. <laughs> Do any of you work uh, with off-grid systems that you could talk about in your countries? Do you, are there perhaps uh, particular interests, you know, other than uh, we spoke about water, biogas, uh, photovoltaics, uh, uh, solar thermal cooking, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps there's something that you guys are interested, in, which we didn't speak about. Uh, uh, go ahead, Luca. I hear you see your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question regarding solar dryers. Do you have them? I didn't see them in video. So you're right. So um, you have a question about it. We 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 have a solar dryer that I didn't put into the video. Come to the next video, and we'll have one for you. Um, but do, do you have a specific question? Uh, perhaps uh, we'll output a general description, perhaps uh, not okay. anything specific. So we have a, um, a very general system, which I'm, 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 I'm not so familiar with it. I have another mechanical engineer that was working with it. Um, so we have, we actually adapted, we have with this, uh, you know what is called a, a so solar thermal heater, where, what we use to heat uh, water. Yeah. Yeah. So we have we have a solar thermal heater which is using evacuated tubes, and um, we've adapted the, this solar water heater for evacuated tubes. We've adapted it uh, for for to heat air. So we actually pass uh, air through the system, and uh, the the sun, the direct uh, the, the direct incidence radiation, the uh, is very good at heating the air through this uh, evacuated tube, and it heats this air. And then um, we're able to pump hot air into a building. So I think um, it's more it's more relevant for, for this uh, community uh, where we live in very cold environments uh, and you have really good uh, solar radiation. Uh, we've we've made an adaptation. We can use a solar thermal water heater, which has been adapted to heat air. So it heats the the, the building up and saves you the, the need to add external energy, which is maybe from a, a coal, fire, a coal uh, source or a gas source. Um, so uh, we can use it to, we've adapted the solar dryer to heat air. We also have uh, the same solar system um, can be used to dry coffee or to dry uh, fruits, etc. cetera. Um, many years ago, I had a friend of mine from, who was working with uh, Starbucks, uh, was complaining that his uh, his electricity bill for drying the coffee was so high, and he was looking for um, a solution, a solar thermal solution. Now, back then, this was uh, ten years ago, we didn't have one, but now we're starting to work uh, on this uh, application for for drying of fruits, coffee, etc., or even for heating buildings. Um, and it's a very very simple system. Uh, Luca, I think it's time that you come to visit me in Israel, and we'll show you some stuff. Okay, Good pleasure. Hey, everybody gets the everybody who asks questions gets invitations and make gets free coffee from me. Go ahead, Gordana, free coffee um, for you. Um, this is uh, off grid uh, village. I am not sure. I haven't seen uh, they have uh, battery storage. Uh, if they have, what kind of battery storage do they use, and uh, what is capacity of that storage? Thank you, Gordana. Um, so you're right. I didn't show you the the batteries that we're using. Uh, and that's uh, that's my fault. I didn't get to show all of the technologies, but we are using a very small battery systems, very very small in in this particular village. I mean, nine ampere hour storage up to uh, twenty four ampere hour storage. Not a lot. Very very small systems enough to power a, a LEDs. Um, we use uh, lead acid batteries, unfortunately, and. Um, 
uh, and we also have a, a gel gel battery and we had once also a salt battery we had a, an innovative company that had developed a low low technology solution for off-grid settings using salt um, they're still in the development phase um, personally I, I'm also working on another facility as I, as I mentioned in, in a it's actually five minutes drive from this facility uh, where we're going to be doing around about 10 kilowatts of storage. Um, unfortunately, also lead acid batteries. I say unfortunately, lead acid batteries also uh, create pollution. They have a two year life cycle, depending on how you manage your power. Um, I would like to see other systems. And it's, and it's also one of the reasons why I don't uh, try to go more into lead, as, lead uh, battery acid, uh, lead acid uh, battery storage. Um, I personally, I simply don't like them. I know it's very popular and it's used in, uh, it's very popular because of the uh, automotive industry and because you have many car mechanics uh, available in developing countries, it's a popular technology. Um, right, we're trying to look at other solutions, but we don't, we don't have all of the solutions just yet. Um, we, there is something else going on up the road. So when I want to say up the road, I'm saying, which way is this way in my picture if we drive that way about uh, 15 minutes there is a, a farming community up the road that is using something which is very very cool it's called an air battery so people are saying what 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 air battery we said lead acid batteries air battery what is this so an air battery it's a company called Ogwind. have you heard of them uh, gordana Ogwind? i'll, I'll no, I'll show you the, I'll show you I put the the website now basically okay. what they do is they are um, storing they they're, they're storing energy at night when the when the electricity is cheaper uh, we're talking about commercial grade electricity we in Israel we have a differential tariff uh, between night and day for commercial grade electricity at night when the electricity is the cheapest they are running a compressor and they're storing air underground in 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 uh, in tanks underground they use the 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 uh, geological integrity of the earth to hold the the tank together and they store it in very high pressure uh, underground at night when the when the energy is cheap and then during the day when the energy is more expensive they use their stored energy to to run turbines and to produce power so this is more this is not for uh off-grid small scale this is a small scale commercial but this is an example of a different type of uh, uh, storage uh, technology and we, they also want to be people who are starting to look at uh, pump storage pumped water storage here but this is still uh, further away so in the village the way we store electricity uh, where we store power is we store it in the form of biogas we store it in the form of producing something for example um, if I could store uh, water or electricity, so during the day, let's say I have uh, power, should I store the el electricity in the, form, in, in the form of electricity and in batteries and then use it for later? Or if I'm driving a service, should I produce the service now? And when it comes to something like water, we prefer to produce the water now because it's cheaper for us to store water during the day than it is to store electricity. So it also depends for what purpose, for what service do we want to use the electricity? And if it's obviously, if it's for lighting, then we have to store it in the form of, a, of, of some kind of electrical and some kind of DC power, and then it will be a battery. If it's in the form for cooking, we prefer to store it in the form of gas. If it's for the service of water, we prefer for the water. But if there's no choice, then we have to go for the battery at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, how many villages do they have in Israel, uh, that kind of villages? Is it experimental or you have many uh, villages? So what we've done here, thank you for the question, it's important to, to clarify. Um, Israel is a very wealthy country, uh, in, general, in generally speaking. I mean, and we are, we are almost all... Uh, people in Israel, and I mean across all of the religions, across all of the, uh, the different groups, almost all of the people are, are connected to the grid. There are people uh, that live in the, in the Negev desert, uh, the Bedouin people, that, that also some of them live off grid, and some of them do so by choice. This is a cultural way of living. In general, we don't have so many off grid villages, 
And the village that we see in the background was in, it's an artificial village. We are, um, uh, Avigail and I, we are staying nearby to this community called Ketora. Ketora itself is a kibbutz and it is on grid. It is a wealthy kibbutz. We are connected to, to water, to electricity, to sewage, to all of these things. And on the side of the kibbutz, we have our, uh, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. And here we created a completely artificial village. This is a village that we created to demonstrate these technologies of what it may be like for uh, in an off-grid situation. And the village is here for us to, to serve as a research and demonstration platform for off-grid technologies. So we have entrepreneurs, researchers, students, uh, business people that come to the village to, to see off-grid technologies in what they would be in, in, in a situation that would be natural to their normal installation. And here's where we test them, we prove them. I try to break them if I can. If not, and if they survive me, if they survive the desert, they get exported to their country of destination. And Gordana, because of, because of your lovely questions, you're also invited for a free cup of coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Natasa Stefanoska. Hello. I would like to hear your question. Uh, hello. I will want to ask you, have you considered setting up a windmill on this farm? Is there not enough wind or what? Yeah, thank you for your question, Natasa. Um, we have considered uh, setting up a small wind turbine on, on this area. Um, there's actually two reasons that we have not set up the wind farm, the wind turbine as of yet. One is um, it, we, we in the Arava are not, uh, we don't have a great uh, uh, re, uh, wind resource. We, we do have wind, but it's, uh, it's very weak, uh, very variable, and it's not our, um, it's not our a very reliable source of energy in our location. Um, in, in, in the north of Israel, where it's more mountainous, uh, we, have, we do have commercial wind farms and that's where they're, they're located. But unfortunately, where we are, we don't have such great wind. And the second reason that we, even though I want to install it anyway, just for the, for the experimentation, for the, for the demonstration, uh, another reason that we haven't installed, installed a wind turbine just yet is we're just before a, a major infrastructure expansion on our facility and um, I didn't want to start uh, installing new infrastructures until, the, inf until the, the, the construction is done. Once our construction on our infrastructure expansion is completed, then I will uh, look uh, where is the, the appropriate place to install uh, a small wind turbine. But the primary reason that we didn't install the wind turbine is simply we don't have enough uh, wind resources in our area. I hope that answers your question, Natasha. Yes, thank you. Luca, go ahead. I hope you drink something more than just coffee, my friend. <laughs> <Or> maybe. <laughs> uh, I have a question about uh, wind turbines. Uh, you, you mentioned some roadblocks about it. Uh, I have a question regarding not in the infrastructure itself, but uh, licensing. We in Tbilisi, for example, in Georgia have a restriction on wind turbines. We can't install it without a permit. Is there something, a problem uh, in your village? So um, uh, in general, thank you for your question, Luca. Uh, in general, we do have to have a license to uh, produce electricity into the grid. So um, th there's two issues. Then one, one is the right to, to produce electricity and one is a, 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 a code in, in building standards. So let's talk about building standards first. It's, it's a little bit simpler. Um, in Israel, I have certain codes, for example, above three meters, I have to have a permission from my, my local engineer. My council engineer has to give me a permission to build above three meters. So anything below three meters is okay. No one's really going to ask too many questions, obviously, for safety purposes, having you know a bunch of blades flying around at high velocity, we should be we should uh, consider safety. But below three meters, the, the the regional engineer is not really going to get involved. But also, the problem is below three meters, the velocity of the air is a lot slower. So the higher we go, the better chances we're going to have of higher velocity air. 
and then we're going to need a, a permit. Now, obviously, when we go higher, we're adding on cost. So we have to make sure that we are producing enough electricity to justify uh, the height, you know, that we're making enough money. And again, we go back to the issue of in our region specifically, we don't have um, uh, so much uh, wind resource. That's why it's not so much justified. But the other reason, um, the other issue when it comes to uh, this uh, system, do we have, do we need approvals, is the right to produce electricity. Now, me as an individual, I'm, I'm allowed to put a small wind turbine below three meters and I can buy one for, for a few hundred dollars and I can produce enough electricity to power my own uh, cell phone. Okay, no, one, no one's going to talk to me about if I'm powering my own cell phone. And that's a deal that I make with me and myself. But if I want to sell the power to you, Luca, okay, now I need to have an, a license to be able to do such a thing legally in my country. So now I have to make a private a power purchase agreement or sales agreement with you. And here's where I do need to have an approval from the country. So the way it works is, first of all, I produce the power and I give the power to the, the local grid. The local grid recognizes that I've given them the power and then they pay me for that money or they'll transfer the electricity to you, electron by electron, and then you'll pay me directly. There is a way for us to do this in Israel and this is uh, an accepted way. And we even have a, um, a well-planned uh, feed-in tariff for, for such a scheme. But, um, but the two main uh, elements that you asked for and in summary is that we have um, building restrictions and the need for approval above three meters. And you have to have um, a, a legal agreement with the power authority to be able to become a private power producer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hayek Levonoyan. Levonian, excuse me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Uh, yes. So normal. Uh, it's okay. I also want coffee because I have one question. We we'll get you. We we'll get you the coffee here. <laughs> Good, Hayek. What is your question? Uh, like, my question is about floating panels. Uh, floating systems on lakes. Do you uh, tend to apply all these? So, um, we, we have what's called floating PV. It exists in Israel, but um, we have some big projects which are currently underway. Uh, they're also used a lot in um, uh, water reservoirs to stop the evaporation of the water. Sorry, who is the translator? Anna Dimitri? is translating into Russian. Dimitri is translating from Russian into English at the moment. I think Anna is translating. We're not. We, we're not supposed to see her. She hear her. She's on the Russian channel. I just don't know uh, when she's finished the translation. No, uh, William. I'm sorry. I'm here. Yeah, I'm translating for hike. Okay, so Dmitri is translating for hike right now. You can talk, Will. Uh, okay, so as I said, we, we do have floating PV. Uh, it's been around for about 10 years in Israel. Um, it's a very small portion of our electrical supply. It's, it's not a major portion of our electrical supply. It's used mostly in uh, deserts, uh, desert areas where we have water reservoirs, and they use it to stop the evaporation of the water. And obviously, we know that the water itself serves to cool the photovoltaic panels. And since the photovoltaic panels are negatively affected by high temperatures, it helps the photovoltaic panels to produce more power because of their cooling. Thank you. Uh, 
What's the output and what's the uh, negative environmental output of uh, panel dimensions, uh, Will? So um, the output, I'm not sure about the specific output and I would have to go look into technical manuals, but it's related to your temperature coefficient. So on every, every panel has got uh, an alpha and beta temperature coefficient and you should look at your temperature coefficients look at what temperature you will be operating the panel and then you'll be able to do the calculation of what is the uh, gain of the cooling. That's number one. So I'll just wait for Dimitri to, to finish. <laughs> I finished, sorry. Uh, okay. And then the second part of, to answer Hike's second part of his question is, is there a negative environmental effect? And here, um, I don't know specifically. So I'm, I'm, I'm only using my imagination. I can imagine that there may be some uh, adverse effect if there are birds that are using uh, the, the reservoir and they can no longer access the reservoir or maybe you have some growth of different type of algaes that may be affected but this is something that we need to study specifically on the location and see what is the effect. Thank you, hi. Come for coffee. Спасибо. <laughs> uh, thank you so very much. Yeah. Natasha, did you have another question? Uh, no. Will, there's a question, in, a the, question in the chat. Yeah. From what about biomass? Are you using it in your village? Um, at the moment, we, we don't use uh, we don't use biomass in the village. Um, it's the opposite. We try not to use uh, biomass. Um, it, what we do is we, any biological uh, waste that we have in the village is uh, fed into the biogas system. Uh, that way, we're uh, controlling the methane emissions from our uh, facility. And we also think that the uh, burning of biomass is very dirty and harmful uh, for, the, for the lungs. So any, any agricultural waste that we have goes straight into the biogas system. And any uh, uh, dry plants that we have goes for composting. I hope that answers your, your question, Teuta. Uh, and you're also invited for coffee because of your even online questions are also invited for coffee. And if you guys don't drink coffee, you can also drink tea. You're also welcome. Any, Any more questions? questions, Okay, I guess there's no more questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Suleiman, Suleiman, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hi, okay. Hi. So uh, thank you very much, Will. Um, let's uh, go on to uh, Suleiman, who is here to um, talk a bit about the project that you all have to submit on Tuesday that we'll be presenting on Tuesday and if anybody has any questions about the project. So thank you, Will. Uh, if anybody wants to ask Will any more questions, you can do it through me. And uh, I also um, uploaded uh, biographies, short biographies about all the presenters and their email addresses onto the Google Drive. So you can uh, find Will's direct email address there as well. 
by Will. Uh, Suleiman, on to you. Yes, thank you, uh, Abigail. And hi, everyone. Uh, it's me again. Um, I think this was one of the best uh, virtual tours I have been to. <laughs> well, did a very good um, and amazing job, actually, in explaining every technology and every station in the, um, in the village, which I hope will give you some ideas about what to, what to propose in your project. Now you have a very good uh, understanding of what actually, what is out there, what exists. And if you want to, uh, if you want to utilize that or integrate it in, in the project that you are proposing or the solution that you are proposing, that will be great. This is actually what we prefer. Um, what we used to do is this uh, tour used to be in the beginning of the project or of the course. So you actually, the participants go out there and see what exists and all that and gives them some ideas of how things can be uh, can be done in their own uh, country or back home. Um, so you have now uh, less than one week for the final presentation. If you have any feedback, any questions about your progress, um, any ideas, anything that you want to share, this is the right time to do it. Yes, Luca. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, uh, the size of the project. Uh, 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 should we submit only a presentation or uh, will we need to have prepare some paper or perhaps a summary or concept of something of that sort? No, for now it's only a presentation. The best, what we prefer, and this is just, uh, you know, what, what we like to see is something that can be applicable when you go back home. It's like a, an actual project that you will do in, in, your, uh, uh, in your community, in your, in your country. Um, but for the course itself, what we require is just to present, to do a presentation. Thank you. Abigail, you, you mentioned something about the... Uh, the certificates is this do you, do you want to mention that here or yes, uh, yes. uh thank you Suleiman. um at the end of the program uh everybody who's been uh taking part in the program um you will receive certificates of participation uh in the in the uh, seminar and those of you who do submit the project uh will um, receive certificates of uh, participation active participation and submission of the project at the end of the program uh, just so you know, there'll be like two levels of, uh, of certificates at the end of the program. Thank you. Um, so, so, so had the question before? You raised your hand, right? Yes, yes, I want to ask about time of our presentation. Do we have limited time or Um, yeah, you. If I understood correctly, it's like how much time do you have for your presentation? Usually, it uh, depends on the number of groups. I think we have here. Uh, Listen, the session, five the groups. session on Tuesday. Yeah, the session on Tuesday is three hours long, uh, so we we should have enough time. That's enough time for everybody who wants to present to present, and enough time for a bit of a summary of the whole course. Um, don't take up an hour. I think presenting for uh, 10, 15 minutes, something like that should be okay, right, Suleiman? Yeah, yeah. And also what yeah. you need to do is- Five, like, 10 minutes, yes. Yeah, we, we, are, fine, we, are yeah. Not providing, we are not providing a template for the presentation, but you know, you, you already, what, what you need to do is just to give a background about the, the problem, then the, uh, the question that you are asking about that problem and how you are going to solve that problem. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you again to Will. Thank you to Suleiman. I, I will send out uh, feedback forms to everybody. I'll send that to you guys uh, today or tomorrow in the next few days. Uh, please fill these feedback forms by Tuesday um, by our final session and we'll be going over them as well. 
and hearing what you guys thought about the course as well. Um, if you have any comments about the sessions, about the lectures, um, you know, is that guy single? Uh, how do I get her phone number? Things like that. No kidding. Um, if you uh, uh, like the, the lectures and especially if there's something that you think that we should have touched on and we didn't, we definitely want to hear that from you as well. Uh, so please let us know in the forms that I will be sending out to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, thank Goodbye. you, everyone. Bye. Good day, everyone. Bye-bye.